Hi everyone and welcome to Investing Strategies. It's Alyssa Quorum with Investors Business Daily from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. Today we're discussing the market's recent bullish move and what that means for your portfolio. The chief investment strategist at William O'Neill & Company will give us his take and we'll look at two medical sector stocks he's watching. And the fresh rally means many top stocks are now presenting opportunities to buy. This week's technical analysis will cover the importance of buying breakouts when an uptrend resumes. Plus, ARK Invest is here to discuss innovations in healthcare set to enhance the quality of human life through what's being called the genomic revolution. Investing Strategies starts now. Okay, let's get started with our market insights for the week. Here for today's discussion is Randy Watts. He's the chief investment strategist at William O'Neill & Company, an affiliate of Investors Business Daily. Thanks so much for being here today, Randy. Thanks for having me back. All right, so we had a really bullish signal last week. All the major indexes blasting above their moving averages. What does that mean for the market after a really choppy, volatile month in August? Well, well it means a lot technically. Uh, First, the S&P and the NASDAQ are now both above their 50-day moving average. During this kind of choppy time during the summer, that 50-day moving average had acted kind of like resistance. We'd really like to see that act as support now. So we really want to see both the S&P and the NASDAQ stay above that 50. If they were to have an immediate failure back below it, we would take that as a very bearish sign. But right now, technicals are getting more bullish. Right, and along with that, a lot of leading stocks are, are breaking out of basis. So from IBD's perspective, seeing those leading names follow suit with the market uh, is encouraging. But like you said, we would like to see uh, things holding above this level. But the headline risk remains, even though we do have now a date set for the trade war talks. That's still a big concern out there. Um, let, me, let me make one comment back on the technicals. Uh, you know, it, it is significant. Uh, both the number of sectors now above their 50. There's, there's eight out of 11 O'Neill sectors back above the 50 day. That's bullish. When we were going through this chop this summer, the majority were under the 50. The other thing that's changed is the breadth within the S&P 500. Right now, about 56% of S&P 500 stocks are above their 50 day and 64% are above their 200. So that's bullish. Normally when the market's doing well and humming, the majority of stocks are above both their 50 and their 200. Now, like you said, there's still a lot of macro worries, right? There's, there's the U.S.-China uh, trade relations. There's the unrest in Hong Kong. Brexit is rapidly coming up to us on October 31st. There's some issues with the global economy. And then finally next year we have an election. So there is still a lot of uncertainty out there. Uh, and I think investors, while should be cautiously optimistic, we're really telling clients to add capital back to the market right here gradually. Okay, yes, yeah. so, uh, that's what I was going to ask. How, how are you advising clients to position their portfolios given that this, this is a big change in the market, but we still have even recession fears on the horizon, but, but short term, uh, the picture is looking a little better than it was. Ab absolutely, and we still think it's a growth stock market, so we're still looking for companies that are growing their revenues and earnings. All right, uh, and then really quickly, uh, about the recession fears sure. that we've seen lately with all of the volatility. Uh, are you concerned about that? Do you, how far down the horizon do you think that could be if it, if it does happen? So let me say, so let me to say two things there. First, people have been nervous because the bond market, right? And people look at the yield curve and the spread between different points on the, on the, on the yield curve. Right now, the three months of the 10 year is actually inverted by about 38 basis points. Historically, that's a bearish sign that leads to a slowing economy. Right now, the two to the 10 year spread is slightly positive. When we came on set this morning, it was about two, about two basis points positive. I think the key on the economy is really the US consumer. The US consumer has been carrying both our nation's economy and really the global economy. Right now, job growth is still pretty good. Last Friday's job number was, was we added 130,000 jobs. That was a little bit below estimates at 150, but still a positive number. And more importantly, average hourly earnings were strong. They were up 0.4% in the month, and they're growing about 3.2% year to year. As long as job growth and average hourly earnings stay strong, I think the consumer can stay strong. Remember, consumer spending is about two-thirds of the U.S. economy. So that's really important. We need the consumer to stay strong because business spending is actually down year to year. So I think as long as the consumer is okay, we're not going to have a recession. 
if the consumer's financial picture was to worsen substantially, then I think it would be hard for us to avoid one. Right, so you're looking at uh, a combination of these economic metrics, some we get weekly, some we get monthly, yes. and then also what the, the market is telling us to position portfolios? A absolutely, we always want to take our direction from the market. And like I said, right now, eight of 11 sectors are above the 50. The market's starting to broaden out in terms of stocks doing well. So I think you have to be open-minded and optimistic. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's pivot to our stocks to watch for the week, starting with Edwards Life Sciences. We're doing a bit of a, a medical sector theme to this week's show. So Edwards Life Sciences is definitely a company that has shown up on our growth screens a lot, and it's been able to extend its gains after a recent breakout, uh, gapping up on earnings. So what is your view of, of what the, the stock is doing right now and uh, how you think the company has been performing? Sure. So, so let me first make a comment about healthcare in general. You know, healthcare stocks, it's really a bifurcated situation. A lot of the service names are not doing well. If you look at industry groups, managed care and hospitals are actually trading below both their 50 and their 200 uh, daily moving average, and that's, that's bearish. So what we really like, we actually really like the product companies, so medical products. Edward Life Sciences fits into that. What they do is they make, they make heart valves uh, and they recently got a change from the FDA where they got an expanded uh, indication for their heart valves. And we think that's very significant because it's going to lead to a much bigger patient population that they can address. Right now, their addressable market's about 3.5 billion. We think over the next four or five years, that market can basically double. And that's gonna lead to very rapid, you know, double digit earnings growth. We think next year, the company could do close to $6 in, in earnings. The stock's trading about 226 right now. We think if they hit that $6 number, they can carry a 40 multiple, which would put the stock you know, north of, north of 240. So that's a name we, we really like because of really that expanded mm -hmm. patient population. Definitely, so it sounds like a lot of growth ahead for the company. So with it being extended from its last proper base pattern in buy point where what are what are you looking for are you looking for a pullback it didn't really consolidate when we when we saw the choppy market it's it's been really right. resistance to that volatility so the stock had a nice cup and handle formation which it broke out of it's a little extended uh, but not not too much i mean we would use any weakness really to add to positions but we still do like the stock right here all right, great. And let's also take a look at Haymanetics, which is in the, the blood management uh, area. Do you see uh, a big runway of growth for, for this business as well? Uh, we do. You know, uh, Haymanetics is a smaller company. It's got about a $6 billion market cap versus Edwards, mm -hmm. which is about a 40, $40 billion market cap. Um, the story with Haymanetics is really that they have, what the, what the company does is they have a, an automated blood uh, collection system that's used by you know, ver various both uh, medical service companies as well as product companies to collect blood for research. And what's going on there is they have, a, they have a new product and the product has much higher margins than their last generation product. So last quarter, gross margin for the company was up about 4%. Uh, in addition, as they go through this new product cycle, their customers are just starting to upgrade. Their two biggest customers, which are over 20% of sales, haven't upgraded yet. So we think there's a lot of runway for this, for this new product, and we think that's going to lead to greatly expanded earnings growth. We think uh, the company can do $3.75 or higher uh, next year. If you look at where the stock's trading around 127, if it was just to hold its current price earnings multiple, that would give you a stock north of 150. So, you know, it's, it's one of the things we like. We like a company with big market share. They've got 80% share of market in their, in their main product area. And we love a new product cycle story, right? Especially one that's going to help them expand their margins of profitability. Right, definitely. Uh, and taking a look at the chart, it does look like, er, you know, starting off the week, it is falling below its 50-day. But when you're looking at buying on pullbacks, are, are you looking more at a weekly chart? Or, or how would you view something like uh, a test of the 50-day here? We, we, we do look at the weekly before we look at the daily. We always want to pay attention to the longer-term chart. Like you said, the stock had a nice cup formation. It's basically trading right around the 50 day. So unless it was to pull back greatly from that, we think it's still viable right here. All right. Well, good to know. Thank you so much for your insights as always, Randy. Sure. Thanks. Really appreciate it. All right. And coming up next, we'll be continuing the discussion about why it's key to buy stocks when we get a bullish market signal. I'll show you why when we come back.
Leaderboard helps you invest better with winning stocks picked by our team of experts. Select a stock to see current analysis. Check the chart for buy and sell points, plus get real-time price alerts. Improve your investing with Leaderboard. Start your free trial today. As we've discussed on this show before, the vast majority of stocks move in the same direction as the overall market. And as the market was moving sideways over the past month, many top stocks were consolidating their gains and setting up in new chart patterns. But the major indexes gapped above their 50-day moving averages on September 5th amid news of new trade talks scheduled for early October. And with that bullish move, high-quality stocks are following suit with breakouts into buy range. Now, last week, we talked about why you want to look for stocks showing relative strength during a choppy market. And the recent market action shows us why. So today, let's walk through IBD's tips for buying stocks when an uptrend resumes. Now, investors who had their watch lists ready with high-quality stocks that were fighting off the volatility over the last month and setting up in bases were able to take advantage of buying those names when Thursday's bullish market signal occurred. Now, it's important to note that just because the market uptrend has resumed, that doesn't necessarily mean it will be a long, successful uptrend. We had two failed follow-through days in the market correction of Q4 2018 before a successful market uptrend took place. But strengthening the case for this recent bullish move for the major indexes is the fact that we are seeing a lot of breakouts from high-quality stocks. If we weren't seeing that, investors should treat this new rally with extra caution. But you shouldn't be too cautious when you see the very first signs of a market that's restored to a confirmed uptrend. IBD's research shows that it's important to at least dip your toe in the water and make some test buys. That's because the biggest gains are made at the beginning of a new market uptrend. If you wait too long, you may miss your chance with a lot of leading stocks because by the time you might feel fully comfortable in a new uptrend, those top stocks are likely already going to be too far extended for you to buy them. But on the flip side, it's important to not be too aggressive at the very beginning of a new market rally because once again, a one bullish signal does not guarantee that that rally will stick. Now, let's take a look at a few examples of top stocks that broke out amid Thursday's bullish signal and are trading in buy range, starting with Copart. Now, this is a weekly chart here, and Copart is one stock that was showing strength during the choppy market. Shares broke out of this flat base and heavy volume when the market made its big move last Thursday. Now, the company conducts salvage vehicle auctions, and while that might not sound like the most exciting thing, the company's breakout was also fueled by an earnings report that showed earnings growth of 43% and sales growth of 21%. Now, both of those metrics mark acceleration from the quarter before, and that's bullish. Now, also bullish is this relative strength line, which is hitting new high ground, and shares are still within this 5% buy range here. Okay, now let's take a look at a weekly chart of Universal Display. The maker of OLED devices also had a powerful breakout Thursday. Volume was above average, the relative strength line is at a new high, and the stock remains in buy range. All of those are good signs. And earnings and sales growth has been in the triple digits for the past two quarters, a big plus. And lastly, let's take a look at a weekly chart of Visa. Now, this stock has been on a big run this year, and the breakout last Thursday is providing a fresh buying opportunity. Visa is now near new highs. It's looking to hold within the buy range here. And while Visa's move above the buy point on Thursday did not come in heavy volume, the stock did extend its gains Friday in above average turnover. Now, like springs being coiled, Visa, Universal Display, and Copart were all showing strong action before Thursday's bullish move. And with the new rally, these stocks immediately pushed higher. So to recap, even before a bullish market signal occurs, investors should be filling up their watch lists with high quality stocks that are setting up in bases and showing out performance versus the S&P 500. A bullish day like we had last Thursday can signal a renewed market rally. So when a big move like that occurs, investors should start buying their watch list stocks that are breaking out of bases. The best gains are made at the beginning of new market rallies. So it's important to be prepared ahead of time to dip your toe in the water and start new positions right when a confirmed uptrend resumes. But remember, with the trade war still unresolved, investors should keep a close watch on their stocks and sell when necessary if negative headlines spark widespread losses. Okay, when we come back, ARK Invest is going to explain what's meant by the genomic revolution and how you can invest in the latest and greatest healthcare innovations. 
on Cultural Capital. We are in New York City and San Francisco. Come with me as I tour some of the world's most innovative companies, from Squarespace to C3AI, Giphy, and Figma. Learn how CEOs built growing companies while maintaining the ultimate office culture on season three of Cultural Capital on the brand new Nasdaq.com. Now, earlier in the show, Randy and I looked at two medical sector names for your watch list. And in addition to buying individual stocks, another way you can invest in the healthcare and biotech space is through an ETF. So joining me now to discuss innovations in the medical sector and the ARC Genomic Revolution ETF is Simon Barnett, analyst at ARC Invest. Thanks so much for being here today, Simon. Thanks for having me. All right, so the genomic revolution uh, for those investors out there who aren't quite familiar with, with what exactly that means, can you explain that for us? So the genomic revolution is really a paradigm shift within healthcare. So basically, we're being able to build diagnostics that can detect disease earlier before it manifests into a more advanced illness. And we're also able to build therapies that are personalized to you instead of being you know, one size fits all. And all of this, diagnostics, therapeutics, it's all being empowered by next generation DNA sequencing. So these are instruments and workflows that are allowing us to delve really deep into the genetic building blocks blocks of life. And with that information, that's how we're able to build this amazing transition within the medical space. All right, so you mentioned diagnostics. Let's, let's drill down a little bit more into what exactly are you seeing in that space uh, in terms of this paradigm shift that you mentioned? Sure, so I think one of the biggest areas that's changing is oncology. So typically within this space, within cancer care, um, it's, it's often difficult to diagnose and catch these illnesses before they progress to becoming more advanced. So what we're seeing in the oncology space is, is several things. So first of all, we're able to detect diseases non-invasively and more cost-effectively earlier with a class of technology called a liquid biopsy. So Garden Health is an example of one of the uh, pioneering players in that space. And then what we're able to do is when we do biopsies, we're actually able to match patients to a therapy that's best fit for them. So instead of having to undergo chemotherapy or radiation, within the next five years, we see most cancer treatments actually being personalized, which is a great way to get around some of the side effects that happen when you have to put your body through those things um, and enable better patient outcomes for, for patients diagnosed all the way from stage one, uh, even out to stage four. Right. So when, when you talk about uh, cancer treatments and, and, and diagnosing this, are we one day going to be able to, with this genomic revolution, uh, even prevent these diseases before they start based on DNA? Yeah, Alyssa, you're, you're absolutely right. So um, basically how we see this space shifting is these diagnostics are gonna become much more cost effective to use at scale, meaning you can do them more often. Because cancer is a very elusive and quick disease. You know, sometimes it can uh, move throughout the body very, very quickly. So it's important to kind of go and get routine screening for these sorts of things. Um, and I should mention, you know, in 2003, this was the conclusion of the Human Genome Project, which was the scientific community's first attempt at developing diagnostics like this. It cost $3 billion to sequence a human genome in 2003, and now the most efficient workflows can do it for around five or $600, and overnight. And so with this, we're unlocking so many clinical applications that never would have been you know, cost effective. And so this is exactly one of the spaces that's being transformed the most. Um, and there are also several private players kind of in this uh, liquid biopsy space, like I mentioned. So Garden is public, but you also have companies like Grail or Thrive Early Detection. These are companies focused on the early detection component of oncology. And to your point, I mean, the best therapeutic is not getting the illness in the first place. So if we're able to catch it, as soon as it starts to appear universally we're going to have better patient outcomes. Interesting so uh, you mentioned uh, the costs really coming down for some of these things but also in terms of gene therapy treatments that are on the market uh, a, a few of them now are very very expensive so uh, do you think that's just because we're, we're still in the early stages or is this value-based medicine 
uh, a trend that we're going to increasingly see more of? It's a really good question, and I think it's also something that a lot of patients are concerned about when they're comparing kind of what their treatment is going to look like and what it's going to cost. But you actually brought up a really, really good point, and I want to touch on it, which is value-based pricing. So what we're seeing is, broadly speaking, uh, genetic technologies and genetic engineering for therapy it's, it's actually for the first time we're, we're able to have drugs that are curative, meaning we're not just managing symptoms or kind of prolonging the situation, but we're actually able to dig really, really deep and fix the genetic mechanism that's causing the disease to appear in the first place. So the first thing to understand is, is A, this is, this is curative rather than just patient management. And the second really important thing is that many of the pricing models for these drugs are becoming value-based. And what that means is you pay for the life extension that you get. You know, if you undergo a therapy and it's supposed to add five or six years of healthy, kind of very good quality of life, it's, you're paying at checkpoints. You don't shell out this huge sticker shock price up front. You actually pay over time as the medicine begins to work. And that's a, a new kind of setting that we're seeing within the therapeutic space. All right, well, this is all very exciting, this, this paradigm shift in medicine. Uh, but when you take a look at the stock performance and, and you know, looking at the ETF, we are seeing a little bit of near-term weakness um, in the space. So broadly, what do you attribute that to? Is that uh, due to maybe a short-term slowdown in this genomic revolution? Is it policy-related? What, what would you uh, attribute that short-term weakness to? Right, so broadly speaking, I think when we have a more volatile market setting and people are a little bit concerned maybe around broadly, you know, tariffs or other sorts of kind of macro themes, one thing that ends up happening is people begin to flee to safety, you know, back to indices, back to stocks that have, you know, very high cash piles or ones that are, are, are profitable. And what ends up happening is people will, will move away at the beginning uh, from companies that are, are very innovative and very, you know, somewhat would seem risky. But we're, what we actually are seeing is there's such a, a vast market opportunity ahead of a lot of these diagnostics and therapeutics players. Roughly, we see the market expanding by an order or two of magnitude within the next five years. And so what we're looking for is these companies, we want them to be investing very heavily in their R&D. And we want them to be putting themselves in a position at the beginning of this exponential growth curve to really capture the lion's share of the market. So while some people may be looking at indicators of profitability or things like like that, we're actually looking at how much are they able, are they able to reduce costs and grow their market? Uh, how are they enabling better patient outcomes? Because the thing about healthcare is it's universal and it's always going to be something that impacts virtually everybody's lives. And so the companies that are putting themselves in the position to best capitalize on that growth are companies that we want to invest in. And so that's why um, you know, the flagship genomic portfolio for ARC, ARKG, is filled with companies that are, are, are rapidly making costs uh, lower to patients and enabling better patient outcomes through early detection, as you mentioned, and also more precise therapies. Right. So for some investors who really are looking at that profitability metric, uh, how, how should they consider an ETF like this, uh, you know, evaluate in terms of, like you mentioned, a lot of these companies, they're putting a lot into R&D mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of, you know, uh, part and parcel of, of a lot of names in this industry is they don't really have that one earnings metric, but mm -hmm. the future prospects are are very positive. So, yeah. so how should investors kind of kind of weigh some of these things when they're when they're looking at an ETF like this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we speak about companies that are investing heavily, it's also very important that we're seeing benefits begin to accrue and manifest out of that. And so, if we look at diagnostic companies, one specific example that I think outlines what I'm describing is Invite. This is a company that has really democratized democratize the genetic testing space. You know, back in 2014 or 15, it cost them roughly, you know, twelve, thirteen hundred dollars to do a genetic test. And now they push that down below 250 or so. And so yes, they've been spending a ton, a ton of money on automating every step of the workflow and uh, you know, really figuring out how to drive these costs lower and lower and lower. But what we're seeing is a, a com concomitant ramp in volume. Again, back in 2014, I think they delivered something like 4,000 tests a year. And this year, they're guiding to 500,000. It's such a quick amount of time. And, and, and yes, there is a lot of money being spent, but the, the benefits are, are, are very, very apparent. And so I think what people can do is sort of step back and see 
what do the other metrics look like? You know, how are they driving costs lower? How are they enabling new markets that never would have been uh, you know, cost effective at scale? So we want to see investment, but we also want to see the investment translate into something mm -hmm. material. All right, so uh, looking at the ETF a little more closely, how, is, uh, how are the weightings determined? Because you have some really bigger players in this space like Bristol Myers Squibb having, having a uh, smaller weighting than maybe some other, other names with smaller market caps. So how, how are the weightings determined? So in an active ETF scenario, you know, both myself and my colleague, Manisha Sami, who covers therapeutics, we work really closely with our portfolio manager, Kathy Woods. So we have almost daily discussions about your point about the portfolio weighting. And typically there's not necessarily a, a very rigid you know, system on a daily basis, but some of the things that we look for, you know, we track the ability for the company to execute, moat, their barriers to entry. We also have a 15% hurdle rate for anything within the portfolio. So we expect basically a rough doubling every five years uh, for each of these companies just to be included within the portfolio. We also look at the different types of patient populations that they address. You know, and I'll go back to another example I mentioned, uh, Garden Health. You know, they're, they're trying to do early screening as well as therapy guidance and even recurrence monitoring for patients who have already come, uh, gone into remission and they're, they're checking to see you know, whether or not uh, the cancer is staying away. So we also look for those very diversified companies. We typically do not invest in companies that are binary, you know, the ones where their entire market cap kind of is hinged upon the success of one key drug development. And so in that way, we kind of mitigate some of the, the issues with volatility while at the same time getting a really good close exposure to the genomic revolution. Well, this is a very fascinating space and it sounds like there's still a lot to come with the genomic revolution. So thanks for really breaking down uh, a subject that can, can be at times daunting uh, to someone from the outside looking in. Thank you, Simon. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. All right. And thank you all for watching Investing Strategies. We'll see you right back here for our show next Tuesday. After that, our weekly Monday schedule will resume. Until next week, this is Alyssa Corum.